The sound of street traders is nothing new in the streets and many entries of Belfast. In fact, they've been hawking their wares around here for years. The story of busy, bustling Belfast began in the early 1600s, but in fact its name is even older than that, coming from the Irish Belfurtia, meaning the crossing at the sandbank on the River Farset. Fine location and well worth defending. So defended our forefathers did. At first, there was just a cluster of small forts, but by 1177 the Normans had built a castle complete with walls, ditches and ramparts. Built somewhere around here, Castle Junction, High Street, the castle was merely a lookout point to protect the strategically much more important stronghold further up the loch, Carrickfergus. The Normans never really took to Belfast. It was more trouble than it was worth trying to control the locals who kept ransacking the castle. They rebuilt it several times but gave up in the end, and in 1456, the settlement returned to the Belfast branch of the O'Neill clan. We moved down from the Castlereagh Hills for a des res in the centre of town. Today, no trace of the castle remains, except in the place names, reminding us of a time long ago. It's not just Belfast's historic buildings which have disappeared. So too has the River Farset, which used to flow down what is now High Street, right here, taking boats directly into the heart of the town. It was a seafaring town, with the captains of the visiting ships taking lodgings in nearby Skipper Street. I know it's hard to visualise, but in the dead of night, if you put your ear to the ground, you can, you can still hear the river flowing underneath, honestly. In 1604, a colourful character called Arthur Chichester was sent to Belfast by James I to create a town of good form. Chichester did just that, and the king rewarded him by granting the town a charter and making Arthur Chichester the Baron of Belfast. In 1615, Belfast became a corporation run by myself, Arthur Chichester. Hello. And that began my family's connection with this city, which has lasted for quite a long time and has had such a great impact. I think you'll find that's mine. Uh, hundred pound? Yes, please. Thank you. Chichester Street, I own that. Thank you. Thanks. The Chichesters were absentee landlords, but while they didn't spend a lot of time here, they owned most of the place nonetheless. They picked up the title of Donegal along the way and were typical toffs of the time, complete with foolhardy son. Yes, George Augustus, the second Marquess of Donegal, was a compulsive gambler who fled his creditors in London and came to Belfast. But the lure of the gaming tables proved too tempting and George Augustus managed single-handedly to lose the entire family fortune, including most of Belfast, on the luck of the cards. Humiliatingly, they weren't able to pay for this very impressive building which they'd been constructing on the outskirts of the town. But then, in stepped kindly brother-in-law Lord Shaftesbury. Yes, that same philanthropic earl who'd been successfully fighting for the rights of children. He took over the castle and paid off the mortgage. But while the Donegal's wealth and influence dwindled, the fortunes of the French Huguenots who had come to Belfast to flee persecution was on the up. They helped develop the burgeoning linen trade, improving the fortunes of local industry and attracting new workers and wealth to the town. The linen industry boomed during the time of the American Civil War due to the shortage of cotton. And at its height of production in 1894, it was estimated that Belfast produced 644 million miles of yarn in that year alone. Standing 350 feet high, the cranes Samson and Goliath are of almost biblical proportions. They have changed the skyline of Belfast since they were built in the 1960s and have become part of the city's heritage and identity. So much so, you can even see them on the back of an Ulster Bank five pound note. There they are. In 1750, Belfast began developing as a port with many a trading vessel sailing up and down Belfast Loch. 
All this activity led to the formation of the Ballast Board, the forerunner to the Harbour Commissioners. Now they dredged a channel in the lock to allow the biggest ships in the world to sail up and down it. And it wasn't long before Belfast was building boats of titanic proportions too. But sadly, the glory days of shipbuilding are now over. At one time, more than 30,000 people worked here. Now, there are just a few hundred. One of the most distinctive features around Belfast is the spectacular Cave Hill. And it was this very Cave Hill that inspired Jonathan Swift when he was rector at Kilroot to write Gulliver's Travels. And if you look very closely, you can see that the outline of the hill itself is very similar to the profile of Lemuel Gulliver. Look at this. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. The Cave Hill also played an important part in our history. For around the end of the 18th century, saw a rich time for radicals and reformers. Henry Joy McCracken from Belfast was one of the founders of the Society of United Irishmen. McCracken, along with Wolf Tone, swore their allegiance up here at McCart's Fort, at the very top of Cave Hill, overlooking the city. But the United Irishmen and their lofty political ideals came to nothing. For in 1798, when insurrection broke out, Henry Joy McCracken attacked the English at Antrim Town. Defeated and on the run, he was captured in Carrickfergus and brought here to the Northern Bank for trial. The exchange building, as it was then, had been specially commandeered by the military for the task. He was tried for treason and found guilty. He was brought to Corn Market where he was hanged. All of that happening in the same day. And with the defeat of the United Irishmen and the passing of the Act of Union, Belfast became part of a union that was to bring the city mixed blessings over the next few hundred years. Poor old Henry Joy, eh? We're related, you know. Francis Joy, that's me, founder of this newspaper, the newsletter, oldest surviving paper in Europe. So I suppose you could say we've both been making the news. <laughs> The city's astonishing growth wasn't down to the great and the good whose names litter the history books. Rather, it was down to the thousands and thousands who came in from the countryside looking for work in the factories and the mills. In the 19th century, the population grew from 30,000 to 300,000 and Belfast just couldn't cope. There had been riots among the poor in Belfast way back in the 1750s, but the fighting that broke out in the 1830s was between Catholics and Protestants. In 1888, Queen Victoria made Belfast a city, and the gratitude of those city fathers was stamped on buildings throughout. Exquisite architecture, Georgian, Victorian, and Edwardian in style, boasted a confidence and pride in the city. For us genteel types, there was plenty to do. We had the city parks, the theatres, and our members' clubs like this one to keep us occupied. For the lesser classes, there were always Belfast singing saloons where the demon drink was encouraged. These were often rough and bawdy, and sometimes frequented by women quite the worse for wear. Which takes us neatly to the Albert Memorial Clock Tower, situated at the Old Port, right in the heart of what used to be Belfast's Red Light District. Clocks are renowned for famously listing to one side, which gives it and the ladies of the night who used to hang around here a lot in common, in that they both had the time and the inclination. The inclination, yeah. The list of famous citizens of Belfast is rather impressive, from footballer George Best. Here comes Best again. What a player this boy is, he's got another! to artists William Connor and Sir John Lavery, and from inventor John Boyd Dunlop to writer C.S. Lewis and his magical Narnia. Their achievements are renowned throughout the world. <clears throat> Why don't fairies get pregnant? <laughs> I can't read, I'm sorry. <laughs> and the motto is PTQ, the motto of Belfast, PTQ, pro tanto quid. In return for so much, what shall we give back? And there you have it. That is your pocket history to Belfast.